Thank you very much, Kevin. And uh, as always, a special thank you to Kathy uh, for making these events run smoothly. Can I just ask, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, that's good, that's good. Right, before we get into this, into the details, I'd like to make it clear that trading without charts is not supposed to be a challenge. So this isn't like riding a unicycle blindfolded or boxing with on one arm tied behind your back. This isn't really like advanced super trader techniques we're talking about. What we're going to do is boil trading down to a few fairly simple concepts. Who's long? Who's short? Where are traders trapped? And where can we get into the market with minimal risk and good potential reward? Now you can combine the techniques we're talking about today with chart trading. For many traders though, they're stuck in the loop of trying to find the perfect set of indicators or paddle of, pattern of candlesticks to trade off and really getting nowhere. So for those people, I'd say give these techniques a try on their own first. Now for the other people, the ones that already have an edge off the chart and you're looking to improve upon it, I'd say don't throw away anything that is already working for you. Bottom line, this method of determining where to get in and out of the market does require you to change the way you think about the markets a little. It's not really complicated, it just requires a different mindset. Now what we're talking about is the way that most prop traders start out. Prop firms tend to teach their interns to trade this way mostly because it's the fastest way to get them profitable. Now I've met prop traders that have gone from never trading before to trading a live prop account, just one or two lots in 12 weeks. Okay, now I've also met retail traders that have still not profitable, still don't know what to do after five years. Um, many of the prop firms won't let their traders use charts at all uh, until they're profitable without them. Okay, now some of the things that we discussed today are often going to be visible on both the charts and the profile. Okay, you're going to see that today in some of the examples, but it's not always the case, and we're going to use the profile because that still has the edge. Okay, so on to a new chart. Looking at the markets from a chart perspective, we usually can consider the extremes of the swings to be support and resistance. Now, some traders will look at the open close of candlesticks and ignore the tails. Um, other trades will just use the highs and lows. If we're looking at a pullback based on this chart here, there's not a lot of information to determine where a pullback might end. So people might use Fibonacci levels or an indicator like a moving average or an oscillator like MACD. What we're going to be looking at today is the intraday volume profile. Now I know a lot of you will probably have seen FT71 stuff on long-term volume profiles. This is slightly different when you're looking at a volume profile intraday. Okay, So what we're looking at, it's just the volume traded at each price in the current session. And the volume profile usually comes in one of two ways. It's either a column of numbers, a single column of numbers, or a histogram that shows us how many contracts are traded at each price. Now we're going to be looking at using the volume profile to define exactly where to get in and out of trades. Okay, but before we actually look into the details of how to get in and out, let's consider why a single column of numbers often tells us more than a price chart. Now obviously we can see from this picture, when we pull up a volume profile, we do have a very different picture from the chart. In this example, we can see that there's certain prices where not many contracts traded. We can see an area where a lot of trading took place. And we can start to make some educated guesses about um, whether the traders that got in, in this area, are still in the market if one side has got out already, where the winning side will defend their positions, where stops are, and if they're about to be run over, which is a breakout, where a pullback is likely to hold, and if a, conti if a continuation is on the cards, and areas where the market will move slowly, 
and where it will move quickly in the future because that will impact the amount of time you have to make a decision once in a trade so it's much better to have the slow moving area on the losing side of your trade now not only does this give us entries it also gives us the chance to enter the market with smaller stops because you know exactly where the pain points are for the traders positioned you know that once you get through one of those pain points one side is going to bail out and that tends to create an extended move so the idea behind using volume profile is that the most important factor in future price movement is not where the market has been as much as where traders are positioned right now and our price charts show you the result of trading but the volume profile has an edge in highlighting those positions currently held by other traders so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through the morning action of the 7th of January now there's nothing special about that day just that I was getting ready for this webinar a week ago now this set this first shot is taken just before the pit session opens. so what we're looking at here is we're looking at the overnight session and as we can see uh, we've got a big move up uh, 10 point move up overnight but most of the volume traded between 2650 and 28 and this area if you can see here I've got these three X's and that's because my preference is when I use the volume profile when the pit session starts I like to clear the volume profile so I'm just looking at the pit session profile and these X's here give me a reminder of where most of the volume traded now of these positions in this 2650 to 28 area some of those positions will be long-term multi-day multi-year trades that's the ES Paul it doesn't really matter which market okay so some of the traders in this area will be long-term multi-day or multi-year trades now we don't care about long-term traders intraday because those traders most likely are not going to exit those positions based on what happens today some of the traders that got in in that 2650 to 28 area will be ARB traders where one half of the trade is on this market and one half on another so a spread trade now we don't really care about arbitrage traders because even though many of those trades are short term and will be um, closed out today the traders don't exit like a directional trader. So for example if you sell the ES and bought the euro stocks the ES rising would not trigger you to to sell the ES part of the position and then some of these positions in this 2650 to 28 area will be short term directional traders now we really 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 care about those traders and those traders also very much care about and react to short term directional moves now we know that every buy is a sell all the market is all the market really does is give a place for buyers to meet sellers so every one of those contracts there we look at 2750 we've got 10,000 contracts traded that represents a place where 10,000 contracts worth of buyers met 10,000 contracts worth of sellers now we also know there is pain for short-term traders above and below this area one of the things I used to hear all the time when I first started out trading oh look for where the stops are look for where the stops are and I could never figure out well, where are the stops because the fact is if you've got a lot of traders in this 2650 to 28 area the stops are both sides okay the shorts are going to get stopped out if we move up above this 28 area and the longs are going to get stopped out if we start moving below this 2650 area now we also know that in this 2650 to 28 area if we get into that area price will move more slowly because of the volume traded there earlier and this is kind of a weird phenomenon that I haven't really got an explanation for uh, but you can see it yourself just watching the market move through areas where we had lots of contracts trade earlier in the day you will see the market move slowly and then when you get out of those areas into areas where we didn't trade so much earlier in the day the market will move a lot more quickly now when you see a range like this scalpers 
absolutely will be scalping that range playing from one side to the other and of course they help us because eventually some of those guys are going to get caught offside and they're going to help them move out of that range so when we see a range like this it is going to break to one side and there will be acceleration when one side realizes the market is truly against them and it has to be said in this example the chart and the profile actually tell quite a similar story but the profile is a lot more specific about particular prices now as I said before when the market opens uh, this is the opening moves on the 7th of January um, I've reset the volume profile so you can't see all that volume from 2650 to 28 anymore but you can see the X's um, that I use just to tell me where the volume was so what we've done we've opened up uh, at 27.75 which is within that area and then we've moved one tick through the top of the high volume area before sellers stepped in defending their positions and we moved down towards the bottom of that high volume area down to 18.26.75 if we go to the top right looking at the second picture we can see only 886 contracts traded at 26.75 and we couldn't make it down to the bottom of this high volume area we reverse again and we start heading up back up to the opposite side so as of taking this we're at 28.25 now at this point some of the shorts from that high volume area will be out of the market okay the remaining shorts from this high volume area are going to be slightly more nervous than the longs for the simple reason is we couldn't reach the bottom of the area but breaking the top of the area was actually relatively easy and this sort of action when you open up in the middle of a high volume area I'd say you're going to see this maybe three out of five days where going into the Globex session you're in an area of high volume and we open up in the middle of it and you can scalp the extremes you can short the high of the range and go long on the bottom of the range but um, you have to be pretty fast the first move to an extreme usually happens in the first few seconds um, and it's very hard to hit that one but the second move to the extreme third move to the extreme uh, tends to happen a lot more slowly now if we go to the bottom left what we can see is we've moved down again this time we did get through the bottom of that high volume area by one tick and just 428 contracts traded there so nobody really wants to trade be below there so there's just 400 contracts, 428 contracts there but if we look above uh, 28 we can see that over 10,000 contracts traded above that area okay so people didn't like trading below that area but they were quite happy to trade above that area so at this point do the longs have any cause to feel nervous well I, yeah I guess you can say the longs have a cause to feel nervous because we did dip down below the area but it, are they as nervous as the shorts and I'd say the answer is absolutely not because at this point the shorts are looking like they're gonna lose the game there's a lot more trading going on above the area of whole volume and at this point you don't know with 100% certainty which way the market is going to break okay you could scalp either side of this high volume volume area and if you do that it's better to have some confirmation off the order flow but often it's too fast to wait for confirmation so you just actually have to get in at one of the extremes and then monitor the order flow after the entry and see if it comes on your side once you're in position so let's see how that played out oh sorry sorry if we go to the bottom right picture okay we can see that the range has broken okay so we can make a few presumptions at this this at this point in time we can presume that the shorts from that high volume area are now mostly out of the market okay on the other hand there's no reason to presume that the longs from that high volume area are mostly out of the market because they're actually in a winning trade if we look at uh, 1827 
we can see that eight and a half thousand contracts traded. So let's just consider the positions that were created at 1827. Okay, now we can presume that if we return to 1827, that many of the remaining shorts that got short there will breathe a sigh of relief and cover their trades. Okay, they're going to buy, they're going to exit. And every, every one of you in this room has done this. You've seen a trade go offside. You've seen it come back to your entry price. And you get out of the trade. Okay. Now, we can also presume that if we come back to the 1827 area, that some of the longs that got long there are actually going to defend that position. Okay, And they're going to do that by buying. Now, one of the other presumptions we can make as we get to 1827 is that the people that went short there last time are not going to be in a hurry to do it again. So if you've just lost two points short in 1827, when you get back to 1827 next time, the chances of you shorting that again are very, very, very low. Okay? So if we think about that one price, We've got a level where we can reasonably expect there to be an imbalance to the buy side. Okay, so if we take a long at 18.27 or 18.27.25, just a tick ahead of it, if it gets down as low as 26.50 or 26.25, we know the premise for getting into that trade is incorrect. Okay, because we're expecting at 18.27 for people to not want to short it. And for people, some shorts are going to buy to exit and some longs are going to go long and defend that position. So if we're wrong, 26.50, 26.25 is where we can get out. If we're right, we can absolutely expect to travel back to the day's high and possibly, be, and possibly beyond that. Okay, so the point with this is you can't always be right. But what you can do is you can define areas where the potential reward far outweighs the risk. So this area, this area 1827 is such an area because buying there would see you with a few ticks risk but almost three tick points potential reward. Now the other thing we can see is at 1829 we've got 16,000 contracts traded and this is exceptional volume at a single price and this is something called a high volume node. Now what we had before between the three X's was a high volume area. Okay, a uh, high volume node is where just one or two prices have exceptional volume. And a high, you know, a high volume area is where we've got three, four, six, ten, you know, twenty prices with exceptional volume. Okay, so right now we don't know if this is the this 1829.50 where we traded is the top of the move? Um, if it's the start of a new range, or if we're going to go straight up. But what we can do is we can focus on the action around this 1829 price. Okay, and I want you to remember these because these are kind of rules for how you look at high volume nodes. If the market moves up say four to six ticks. Now the four to six ticks is specific to the ES. You, you, you take on a thicker market, you're going to use slightly less. If you take on a, a thin market like crude oil, you're going to use a lot more. But if the market moves up, say four to six ticks from this high volume node and comes back to here. So we go from 1829, we move up six ticks, we come back to 1829 where this volume is. The first thing we're going to look for is look for this price to hold. Okay, sellers are going to take the opportunity to get out of what a bad, what was a bad trade, and the buyers are going to defend that price. Now, if the market crosses down through that price, what we've got to start thinking about is we're either looking at a reversal or a new range forming. Now, the reversal is always got to be the least likely scenario on your on your mind okay the the guys that I met a lot of guys who I call them perma faders they're always handing money back to the market okay if a reversal is on the cards we're going to come down through 1829 maybe to you know 1828 come back up to 1829 and not be able to get through that price again 
if this is if there's a reverse on the cards. And then the third thing that we can look at, if we cross down through 29 from the top, and then we go back up through 29 from the bottom, then we have to start thinking that there's a new range forming, and that this price is going to be crossed a number of times, and that the volume profile is going to build a high volume area around this price. Now this is a very likely scenario. This happens multiple times a day. The market loves to range, building positions, then trend, which is effectively moving as one side gets stopped out, and then range again somewhere else, build more positions. Now the reason this 1829 price is so important is simply because of the number of people positioned there. So if we move up a decent amount from here, say 8 ticks, some of the shorts from there are going to be shaking out, shaking out, and some of them will cover when we come back. Longs will feel confident and defend that position. The cross from above and below usually occurs without price moving that far away. Okay, So if you see this large volume at 29 and you see an 8 tick mover, it's much more likely that 1829 will hold. If you see 1829 trade 16k, you move up 4 ticks and come back down, then you've got to consider it's more likely to be a reversal or a range forming. Okay, And the range forming is what we want to see. We actually want to see the range formings, ranges form because the more positions that build up in an area, the bigger the pop will be as one side bails out. Now it's important to consider two things. Now first of all, not everybody is a short term day trader, but it is short term day traders that drive short term action most of the time. That is effectively what day trading is all about. Now there are of course high volume trend days where the market heads in one direction all day, but even on those days you're going to see small nodes of volume building they're just a bit harder to jump on board. You know, to some extent, there's those one-way days. You've just got to suck it up and get on. And the second thing to consider, the reversal is always absolutely the least likely scenario. Now, I don't expect you to take all this in first time round, but I think you can see that this technique of looking at the market does require you to have a slightly different mindset from that of a chart trader. Because the actual price movement itself isn't that important. What is most important is who is positioned where, where they're going to exit, where they're going to defend, and whether we can find a way to capitalize on that. And capitalize on this information might simply be finding a price where the risk and reward is greatly skewed in your favor. Okay? With this in mind, it does become much less important to become right more often than you are wrong. There will be a recording of this. Uh, I wouldn't expect everybody to take all this in first time round. Okay, so building volume. At this point, we can see that we've built volume. We had the 16,000 traded before at 29. And the volume didn't build so much around the 29 price, but with that 29 price uh, as a base, if you like. Now, if we look at the chart on the left, we can see a lot of sideways bars um, around 1829. Okay, so there's a lot of people that would see those sideways bars and say that that market was topping out. I mean, certainly it doesn't look hugely bullish, apart from the big green lines I've got on there, which will obviously uh, make people think it's bullish. Now, after the last slide, we've traded from 1829 to 1830 a total of 13,000 contracts okay but from 2850 to 28, 2875 we've traded less than a thousand contracts so it's fair to say that right now the market likes trading above 29 more than it likes trading below 29 okay. what we can see at 1829 as well is we've got this step okay in the volume profile well, we've got 19,000 traded at 29 and 7,000 traded at 28.75. Now, that is a considerable different difference. And volume profiles tend to be very visual. 
So if a histogram, volume histogram, is not showing a considerable visually appealing step, if you like, then it's probably not an important level. Okay, but in this case, that is obviously a very important price level. Okay, so right now, does it look like the shorts are trying to sell this off? Well, no, not at all. Does it look like longs are holding this market at 29? Yes. What price will the longs give up? Okay, longs are going to bail out somewhere below 29. What price are the shorts going to give up? Well, shorts are probably going to give up somewhere above 30 when we start to go at trading to a new high. So what's your worst case scenario for a long trade? Well, if you took a long at 1829, your worst case scenario is probably three or four ticks. If you're saying, I expect the buyers to hold 1829, there's no reason to stay in a long trade till 1826. As soon as 29 breaks, you know a lot of these guys are going to bail out. Okay, what's the potential upside here well we're at fresh highs for the day so it's kind of hard to gauge a potential upside but you do know that if you get through this uh, high volume area to the top we're going to pop when the shorts from this area start to bail out okay so when you see this sort of range develop you've got a number of potential trades okay so one of the things that you can do is you can scalp the range now the range here is only really, you know, where the volume is, it's only three ticks. So you really wouldn't scalp that range. And, and a lot of the times the ranges are much bigger than that. Okay. Now you know it's going to fail one time, but basically when you see this type of action, it's just going to keep going up and down, up and down to the extremes. And this is, this is a scalper's dream. This is what scalpers do. So a lot of scalpers do. Okay. Now one of the things you do if you do scalp one of the extremes, okay. Um, what you usually see, let's say you short the high here, if it can't make it to the bottom and then you see a lot of buyers coming on the time and sales, that's the point at which you exit the trade. Okay, that's the point where you know they're going to start to run through you. Now the other trade that you can take is scalping one side only and you scalp one side only. So right here, um, a better trade would be to scalp long 1829. Okay. Because the overall direction for the day is up, and so you kind of go in a bit more with the flow if you do that. Now, my favorite trade, and a lot of people don't like this, a lot of people don't like scaling out, but my favorite trade is to buy the bottom and then scale some off at the top. So you buy 29, and then you sell some of the position at 30, and then you hold on to that position and you do let it rotate up and down. So you buy 29. Get out at 30, say a 30 position out at 30, and then you just sit through it going up and down, up and down, up and down, and then you have additional exits above the market. Because basically, in this situation, a breakout upside is slightly more likely than the breakout downside. Okay, and then also the last trade is a pre breakout trade, and the pre breakout trade is basically about watching the market come to one of these extremes and seeing a flood of prints on the time and sales, seeing a lot of people hit the market as they rush to push the market through one side uh, and stop one side out. So those are the trades that we can take. And let's just go on to the next slide, see how we actually see how things worked out. Now the best trade, as we discussed before, the best trade would be long at 1829. Um, and of course, one of the good things about having um, Good risk and rewards, one of the downsides of finding a great price to get in, um, you're not always going to get filled at that price. Okay, it might just not come back to 1829. Okay, so in this case, I did have a bid at 1829. Market didn't want to come back to the lower of the range by the time I decided uh, I wanted to trade it. Uh, but as it moved up, there were a flood of buy market orders, and I jumped on that as it ran towards the top of the range. And when you hear like day traders talking about momentum trades, this is really what they mean. Um, and I like to also call them pre-breakout trades. Because effectively what you're doing, you're seeing a lot of buy market orders come in and you're saying, right, I think they're going to now run that to the high. Okay. Now, in terms of the risk, I've got a stop there at 28.50. I'm not going to wait for it to come down to that stop. Okay. Because this is a momentum trade. And one thing you shouldn't do with a momentum trade 
is let the trade go that far against you. So if you think about what you're trying to do, you're trying to catch the market as they run the top of the range. Okay? So if they don't run through the top of the range, like fairly quickly, you, the premise for your trade is invalid. It doesn't mean it will never pop out the top. But it means that time round, if you're trading, you know the, the the premise that traders are now trying to push you through the high. If they don't get it through the high that time round, then premise for your trade is invalid, and you need to bail out maximum a few ticks lost. Okay, so for momentum phase, you get out of the trade. Now, in terms of how much time you have, you've got perhaps two minutes, generally speaking, to break the high. And if you don't break the high, sellers are going to jump on it because the sellers are going to have seen all of that buying pushing you up to the high as well so they know if they push the market down a few ticks all the buying that pushed up to the high all those guys are going to bail out okay and with any range there's two factors in the extreme holding okay the first factor in whether one of the extremes is going to hold is how many times that extreme has been hit Okay, so usually you're looking at three to four hits at each extreme. Now, I would count all trading at an extreme as one hit until it gets back down uh, to the middle of the range. So, if we hit 30s right now, even if we kind of went 30, 29.75, 30, 29.50, um, I wouldn't count it as a hit of the extreme until it got down through 29.25. Now the second factor in extreme holding is the amount of time it sits at the extreme. So watch out for this. As buyers you know, push us into a high, you'll often see large buy prints on the time and sales, 400, 500, 1000 contract trades at the high. If the market then doesn't tick up through the high, so you're gonna see like 1000 trade at 18.30. If the market then doesn't tick up through 1830, those guys are stuck. Okay, and when you see the big trades, the 500s, the 1000s, a lot of those are very, very short term traders. So they know that they are stuck there. Okay, the guys trading against them know that they are stuck there. And that's why you'll see if price doesn't progress upwards after just like one or two minutes, you're going to see suddenly a, a rush of selling. As these guys exit or get run over, and then that's what fuels the move back to the lower of the range. Okay, so what did we do? In this case, we did get a breakout to the upside. Okay, so our 1829 did hold. Now we can see that since the entry, we didn't get a single trade. At 2950, 1671.41 is um, the same amount of contracts traded at 2950 as the previous slide. Okay. Now, if it had started to trade down at 2950 or 2925, then I'd have considered myself to be offside and for momentum to have faded. Okay. And with a momentum trade, you really don't expect it to trade below you because you really do expect that this is the time they're driving it through. Okay, now at this point, if we think about the the people who are short at 29, I'd say almost all of those guys who were short 29 have been rush, washed out of the market. Now, from an old resistance equals new support perspective, this 1830.25 price looks like it should now support the market. Okay, so for a continuation up from here we should be looking at the market to hold above 3025 if we start to come back into these prices okay we'll be looking um, at the move up to 3175 as a range extension and not a continuation upside okay so if you see this kind of action this step in the profile here if we come back down to here then expect the whole range to expand up to 3175 Okay, and obviously, if we do get into uh, 30, 25, and 30s, we should expect it to hit the bottom of that range. And quite often, when you hit the bottom of the range after an extension to the upside, you get an extension to the downside. 
Now, we do have slightly higher volume also at 30.75, and this is certainly an area to watch. But at this point, um, if you're not in a trade, then 30.50 for me, 30.50 would be the area the area you'd be looking at to see what happened next. And this is how it played out. So our expectation was that the old range would hold as support, but we never actually got that far down. We didn't actually trade uh, 30.25 again. And it's very simple, the reason we expect that to hold, is because the buyers just put in a, a lot of effort to stop out the shorts, and the buyers are going to want to defend that new ground. The buyers have made new ground, um, and they're going to want to keep that. Okay, So we actually only traded as low as 1831 okay we couldn't um, trade lower than this high volume node uh, a 3075 now as I said in the previous slide I would not you know looking at this I couldn't say yeah oh we got high volume at 3075 yeah I knew that was gonna hold normally to me that step there isn't big enough I would still have been looking at 3050 as, as the place to kind of make or break but as it turns out we traded 31 and they didn't want to trade into 3075 okay and now what we can see we can see a range again starting to form with 3150 with the highest volume and 3125 as a potential range low so as a volume profile trader at this point, what you should be doing is taking a seat back, a seat back and give this range time to develop. Okay? Because what we're doing, this isn't about jumping in the moment that you see a range start to form. Okay? What we're trying to do is let the range develop and then find a place to enter where the risk is fairly small. Okay. Now what will often happen, as happened in the entry earlier, is that you find the perfect place to enter, but the market never gets there and you never get the trade. Okay, So you are going to miss some trades doing this. Now if we look at the top right, we can see that our range has developed, perhaps not developed the way we thought it would be, um, looking at the, the, the top left. Maybe looking at the top left, we expect most of the volume to trade around 31.50 um, but what we've actually got is we've actually got most of the volume you know we've got a range and most of the volume is around 31.75 okay now this area 31.75 is the area in our range with the highest volume and the highest traded price is often called the point of control or POC now there is only kind of one official POC for the day okay so we have a point of control for the day but you should also look at the highest volume price for any high volume range as a sort of mini or temporary POC okay and the reason for that is if you've got a scalpable range and actually this is a scalpable range from 3125 to 3225 if you're a scalper okay if you went short at 32.25 and it doesn't get through 31.75 then you could very much look, be looking for the range to fail upside. Now the other thing is when the range develops over a much wider range of prices and you know the 7th of January the ranges were fairly tight if you've got a range that's like 12 ticks on the ES a good idea is to scale out some of your trade at the POC okay because often, often that is the the place where you first find out that the range is going to fail obviously in this case it'd be pretty pointless um, scaling out at 3175 on a short so again the trades that we're looking for scalp the range okay scalp directionally which in this case would be scalp long because the yeah, market's been going up look for the pre breakout, breakout trade or buy the bottom so that would mean trying to buy 3125 scale at the top 3225 and then hold for a continuation trade now 
After a few more rotations, if we look at the bottom left, we took a pop out of the top again. Okay, so we've popped out of the top of the range. Okay, and in this case, we've got a slightly different scenario. Okay, we've popped up and then we started to trade a lot of contracts at just two prices, so 34 and 34.25. Okay. And at this point, we're going to repeat our process. What we're going to look for is we're going to look for this area to hold for upside continuation. So a pop above and then come back and look at this area to hold. We're going to look for it to cross above and below for a range to start to form. Or we're going to look for it to hold from below. So come down and hold this area for a reversal. Now as it is, if we go over to the right, we got 25,000 contracts traded at the high over just two prices. Okay, so just 34 and 34.25, we've got 25,000 contracts trade. And the market starts to head towards the lower range. So what we got, when we got the high volume node, there was no real building of volume around that node. It went up, traded those prices, it did go down, I mean, we did get a little bit of trading above, but it went down below those traces, prices and held. And at this point, at 33.25, the buyers that bought those two prices are feeling nervous at this point. The sellers that sold those two prices, obviously, they feel like their trade's working out. So some of the longs that got in at those two prices are already exiting the market. Some are going to stay in till as low as this 31 area okay when it breaks 31 here it's it's done it's done for the longs that have got in uh, across these prices they've had a good push up uh, but, but it's done once you get through 31 so at this point the market could break either way so a decent short trade would be going short 33.75 because you know if it breaks above 34.50 then the shorts are going to start to exit okay we do have upward momentum overall okay and reversal traders are always a lot faster to exit their trades okay to the downside you should if you took a short of 33.75 you should be looking at 31.25 you should be looking at least to get back to the bottom of this range and then looking at the bottom of this range as a hurdle as a place where potentially you might be done okay so what we got there we've got a risk maybe 3450 um, and a reward 3125 and possibly towards the low of the day okay um, so again we're not really talking about I can guarantee that it's going to move down from here but what we can say is here's a price 3375 where it seems logical to take a short and I can see that if I get up to 34.50, 34.75, the sellers are going to bail out. Um, and likely it's going to go a lot lower than my 3, 4, 5 ticks risk on the trade. Okay. Now that kind of ends the walkthrough um, of the, that morning's action. And and the reason I took this day, is, I took this approach it's just to help you understand the mindset behind analyzing where trades are positioned in real time, okay, or as you'd actually go through it on a real day, um, where they might defend the positions and where they might exit. And I will be putting a recording on my blog should you want to watch it again. Now, when I was putting together this webinar, okay, it became pretty clear that I wouldn't be able to cover anything in an hour and that you do some time for Q&A. So we've covered most of what trading without charts is all about. Um, but there is some more information to include on reversals, um, pullback points and head fakes, which are fail breakouts. But it's really too much to get into the hour. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put together a short video to cover those topics in the next couple of days. So for those of you who want access to the video, let me just give you the, give you the link. If you want access to the video, um, drop your email address um, into that form or, or send me an email. Um, I'm easy to contact 
uh, and then I'll send you the video. So at this point, um, can we open up for questions? Anybody got any questions? Okay, Dimitri, does the market always rotate between high value area to low value area? Well, um, it, it basically, well, this is looking at intraday volume profiles. So, you know, your value area for the day might be a much wider range than just the volume, you know, the, the particular high volume area that you're trading around. But generally speaking, yes, absolutely. On most days, you'll build volume. Move, you know, you build volume, and basically that building volume process is actually—it's actually that building of volume that causes the eventual breakout. So what you're saying, you just most of the time you're just seeing buyers and sellers trading, buyers and sellers trade, buyers and sellers trade, buyers and sellers trade, and that builds all this volume in an area. And then what happens is one side bails out. That's the move. And then all you then and once that moves over, buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers, buyers and sellers, building volume again. So yeah, it, it, this is the way the markets move. Um, absolutely. Uh, the only the only time it doesn't do this is when you're looking at uh, the trend days. So when you're looking at trend days, it tends to move in one direction. It's much harder to spot. Um, do I have a look at volume POCs from previous days? Absolutely. I tend to mark those off. You will see um, if I go back to my charts. You'll see um, these LIS, YH, ONH on my charts. I mark up the uh, value areas um, and stuff from previous days, but I just, generally speaking, I use those as hurdles, um, as places where I think the market might stop more than uh, using them for entries. Um, in terms of time, basically that where I use time is mostly on the extreme of a range because at the extreme of a range, that's where you've got the maximum amount of people trapped, and they don't stay trapped for very long. So if if there's a feeling that buyers have moved it to the top of the range, and then if the sellers kind of get, a, you know, if the sellers smell fear and think that the, you know they can get shake those guys out, they'll start selling it off, and basically you can just see the market will just stop and pause. As those guys, you know, the guys that, you know, kind of, they've already used all their gas to move it up to the top of the range. There's no more gas in the tank and the sellers see that and boom, they hit it straight down. So that's the only time I use, that's the only real way I use time. I don't use time-based charts or anything like this. Um, I don't use market delta when doing this, but I will use uh, a cumulative delta, Paul. Um, basically, I like to use a cumulative delta because... Uh, certainly with the ES, the cumulative delta is a very good indicator of momentum. Um, do I plan to automate the value areas? I've got value areas and VPOC in the depth and sales window already, Al. Um, that's just going to be coming out for release soon. Can I show examples of trades that are very obvious? Um, what I'll do, what I'll do, Dimitri, I'll do some follow-up blog posts on that. Um, it's not hard to determine from the dome, to be honest. It's just that um, this is kind of a new way of thinking about it. So you have to, um, you have to just watch it develop. The thing about the volume profile, it's much easier to use in real time than historically, it's, it's because. Because of the way it builds, it effectively raises historical information as it goes. Um, but basically, it's something you just have to watch and watch this presentation a few times. Uh, LIS is a line in the sand, so that's just an area. It could it, that could be a prior swing high, swing low. Um, like for instance, 46.50 right now would be a line in the sand because it's the all-time high, or it was before yesterday. I didn't check where we traded yesterday. Um, so line in the sand, just just something I put on there that is like an alert. Just be careful. Um, if I'm Tony, if I'm holding a position for what I think will be a 10 point day in the ES, how do you know when the move has ended and should I exit? Well, Tony, I scale out of positions. I have a hard time, you know, um, taking 10 point trades one day and then taking two point trades the next. Um, I think it's very very difficult 
to be a good two point trader and then take 10 point trades when they occur. So my solution to it is I scale out, but I'm usually completely out of a position after five points. It's very rare that I'll still be in a position after five points because I'm not really a, I'm not the kind of trader who tries to get uh, the whole of a move. Um, now, well, in terms of numbers for volume profile rather than graphics, I, I use both. I mean, it's only one column of numbers and it's not that hard to keep up with if you're used to re you know, watching it. Um, I do like the histogram showing up because it does kind of highlight where the, uh, the steps are. But yeah, I, I do use it. But like, if we look at it, sometimes you're only looking at like 20 numbers. So it's not that difficult to use uh, the numbers themselves. Any more questions? Okay, what I'd also like to say, as we seem to be done on the questions, um, for those of you who aren't customers and would like a discount on the tools, we haven't really talked about the tools we provide today. Um, this really wasn't, this, this webinar wasn't intended to be a puff piece for the Jigsaw tools. Um, you can go and have a look at them. There is a 10% discount coupon code there uh, for those of you who have a look. And of course, um, if you're interested, you can contact me. Um, if you email me, I will reply, or if you Skype me, um, I'm, I'm more than happy to have a chat with you. Um, can a person make it as a two-point trader? Absolutely. Um, I wouldn't say that two-point traders necessarily are trading too often, um, but if you, but obviously, you know, it's, it's the old adage: if you can make two points a day trading ten contracts, then absolutely you can make it, and it's much easier to get two point trades than try and hit home runs and get 10 point trades every day. Um, in terms of which market this applies to Jacob, um, is that Jacob from Austria? <laughs> um, this is not specific to the ES. I mean, there's a blog post up there on my blog that's called Trading with Day Trading Without Charts and that's a chat I had with a trader doing this on the 6E. So no, it is, it is, I mean basically, if you think about it, every market is driven by traders getting into it out of position. So if you can know where the pain is in any particular market, then absolutely does apply. Um, how long does it take to master these? Um, it depends how much you um, apply yourself. Jacob in Austria, how long does it take you, Jacob? Because I know there's a guy, I think if that's who I think it is, Jacob in Austria, we did discuss this last year and Jacob's trading live now. So Jacob, how long did this take? We'll see if Jacob's going to answer that. Uh, my percentage of winning trades, um, right with this kind of trading, about 60%. I don't go for a high win rate. I go for the trades working, you making a lot more for me than um, they're going to lose. Um, how did, it, how long did it take to learn you to trade on the dome? It took me a very long time because I didn't have my trading material. Um, and Bob, if you're already a customer, the 10% isn't backdatable. Um, 14 weeks. Okay, so here's Jacob who took 14 weeks to master this. But I will say about Jacob, when I had a chat with Jacob, we literally spoke for an hour and I told Jacob about this stuff. And Jacob went away and he did this every day. Every day he did this. He didn't look at anything else. He did this every day, day in, day out. He would email me his trades, email me what was thinking, ask questions. And if you can do that, then you can you know, be like Jacob and do it in 14 weeks. What probably slips up most traders is when they, um, it's a skill basically, so you're not going to be very good at it when you start. So what kills most people is they, um, you know, they'll trade for a couple of weeks trying it and then they'll give up because they're not very good at it. Whereas with Jacob, Jacob just applied himself. Um, so that's what it's all about, basically. But in prop shops, it's like literally some of the guys are up in 12 weeks. I've heard of one guy in a prop shop, um, he was up in six weeks. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't expect, uh, you know, I think that's the, that 12, 14 weeks, that's the kind of, that's pretty fast. Yeah, that's pretty fast. 
Yeah, I mean, well, JCD, how do the tools complement an already successful trading strategy? It's really about refinement. It's really about trying to reject some of the trades that you would rather not have taken or refining the price a little bit. Um, there's also a webinar we did before which was on staying in the trades. So it helps you to actually stay in a trade while the order flows on your side. Yeah, Jacob, Jacob was good. Jacob was good. The tools do run on Ninja Trader, yes, Dennis. Ninja Trader and um, OEC Trader, which is also known as S5 Trader. We do have time for a couple more questions. Uh, Dimitri, I'm actually, it's actually, um, 5:30 a.m. here. I'm actually in Asia, so yeah, I don't <laughs> I don't trade the full session. I trade the Eurex morning, and I trade the the US morning. Um, so I try I tend to stick to the morning sessions. Uh, Eric, in terms of courses, I think it really depends where you are, and um, you know. You know how far along you are already. If you want to give me a call, um, let me put my contact details up. Okay, um, my Skype ID is just Jigsaw Trading. If you want to contact me on Skype and we can have a chat about where you are, where you are, um, I can rec I can certainly make a recommendation as to whether you should just dive in and start trying it, or whether you should get paid training. We do have a lot of free training material on our site, so if you go to the Jigsaw Trading site, there's a lot of free material there. But sometimes I like, you know, people will call me and I'll try and give them some pointers and, you know, how, how to apply that for them. Um, and I don't, I don't do any paid training myself. Uh, FESX, yes, FDAX, absolutely not. I like slow, thick markets. Yeah, OEC Trader, Zayna Trader. Oh, it's got, it's got a lot of different names, OEC Trader. Yeah, I mean, it, Tony, what's a good gain on 10 contracts? Well, basically, um, if, basically, I look for my first scale out at one point, and then I'm looking at one, every one point after that. So, like, you know, I'll be looking at five, um, you know, hopefully five points, um, but that's kind of less often than like three or four points. And thank you, Mike. Okay, I think we are done. So. Is Kathy or Kevin going to come back in? Are they still awake? I'll post the video, yes. I think I sent Kathy to sleep. Uh, recording will be available um, probably probably in about two hours. <laughs> I think Kevin's gone. All right, we're going to close the meeting. Thank you very much, everybody, and um, feel free to get in touch.